Good morning, First Church. Um, my name is Ryan McDowell. I'm the uh, thrift boutique uh, store manager, and uh, I just want to thank you all um, gathered here and online um, that you're here uh, gathered together, um, all in this one place. Um, uh, I'm especially thankful for um, the love and support uh, from you guys, uh, for me and my family. Um, for, for two reasons. Uh, one, to be able to uh, share this message today, but uh, also the, uh, the work that's done uh, by the many volunteers here. Uh, having two children that were part of VBS, um, it, it put a lot of joy in their heart. And yesterday, Mia's like, how come uh, VBS can't be all summer long? And I, and I said, because you wouldn't see Miss Susie for the rest of the year. <laughs> so... Uh, today we're, we're going to uh, focus in on uh, coming together um, as the body of Christ um, and what that looks like, um, what can divide us uh, to keep us from that. Um, so last week, uh, Pastor Tom spoke about uh, when we were all dispersed uh, f- uh, by God from the Tower of Babel because we were trying to be like God in our own sight, to being brought back together all in one place where the Holy Spirit was poured out on us after the resurrection, which was the day of Pentecost. From there, being empowered by the Holy Spirit, we were able to preach the good news about Jesus Christ. But as new churches began to spring up and spread, division also leaked in. Today, we're going to take a closer look into a letter from Paul to the church in Corinth, which was a believing church, but faced division from unexpected sources. I believe there's parallels to be drawn from the early church to today's church. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, first and foremost, we thank you for this day. We are grateful for an opportunity uh, to be gathered here today to share in your love and peace. Father, I pray that you open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us today. That you show us those areas where maybe we are divided in and lead us to the answers to bring us back to the center, which is your son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that I pray, amen. First, I wanna begin by stating that Paul sometimes gets a bad reputation for some of his writings because either his direct approach towards sin or his bold writings about keeping the unity of the cross at all costs. Paul's heart was always to unify the church in the belief of Jesus. We sometimes can get caught up in whether something seems right or wrong according to what we believe and miss the point about unity in the body of Christ. Obviously, there's many different beliefs and religions, not to mention the different denominations in the Christian faith alone. This can, this can be confusing and or a stumbling block for someone new to faith or a reason for someone to turn away from faith. When faced with confusion or seemingly different viewpoints, I always like to simplify things because I believe in my heart that Jesus' message was simple. And since that message 2,000 years ago, we have only complicated it through our worldly views. Paul, in most of his letters, starts out with a prayer, which I believe scripture is the living, active word of God. So with that being said, this prayer is meant for you and I as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 9, it's a prayer that I feel like is for us today, the body of Christ, and as a church as a whole. And it says this, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Jesus Christ. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you'll be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful 
who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, Paul recognizes Jesus in the church of Corinth, even though he was about to point out some things to work on. Just as we recognize him in our church, so we should also recognize such things in effort to keep the unity of the body and avoid the quarreling that is so prevalent in today's world. Let's pick up in verse 10, which was our scripture reading uh, today, and we'll continue beyond that. Um, This directly has to do with uh, division that was going on in the church. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there may be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. And still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And jumped ahead to verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. The definition of lest is to avoid the risk of. So what Paul is saying here is that he does not want to speak from his own wisdom and eloquence to avoid the risk of the cross of Christ being emptied of its power. When we speak from our own insight or our worldly view, it can drain the saving power of Christ and others. Paul's main message was to be a preacher of the gospel in effort to keep the power of Christ alive. In fact, that should be all of us gathered here, in person and online, preaching the gospel. If you need to know what the gospel is, then I urge you to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are the, the four gospels about, our Je- about Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And also, by the way, the church is not a building, but rather it is the body of Christ alive and active in the world. We can get so caught up in following Paul or a certain preacher or Moses or even leaders in the world that we lose sight in the following of Jesus because as Paul points out in verse 13, is Christ divided? No, of course not. I I get really confused when I hear a brother or sister in Christ have such vastly different world views partly because that's all we seem to talk about or care about. And another part is how we try to fit Jesus into what we think is right or wrong about the world. When we label ourselves as believers, that groups us all together in the eyes of the world. So in order to make a stand, we have to put our efforts more into what we agree upon, which should be our common ground found in Jesus. I take the unity of the body very seriously because it's our baseline to be able to band together to resist the evil spiritual forces in this world. So often we mix our belief in Jesus with the way we view the world. What I mean here is that we put Jesus on a sliding scale. For example... A conservative might make statements about their viewpoints and then try to tie Jesus into the way he or she thinks. Then you know what happens? The liberal point of view makes their case and slides Jesus back to their side. This is not how the body of Christ works. Jesus is, as Hebrews 13.8 puts it, the same yesterday and today and forever. When I see two groups of people on opposite street corners with two totally different messages, I can't help to see Jesus standing in the middle of the road, stopping the traffic that is flying by to preach the good news about him. Who is willing to throw down their signs and bumper stickers of the world and join Jesus in the middle where he's always been? Colossians 3 
8 through 13 says this. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have been taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. There is no Gentile, Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, barbarian Sicilian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is an in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against somebody. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. So how do we do this? Here's how we're supposed to identify each other and truly band together as the body of Christ. John 13, 34 through 35. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And also here in 1 John 4.12. No one has ever seen God but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is ma made complete in us. These are unifying verses to be recognized as his disciples by loving one another. Yes, it's really that simple. A disciple, by definition, is a follower or student of a teacher or leader. Who is your teacher? Who is your leader? Please feel free to speak it now. Type it online. Who is it? There we go. Amen. Jesus. If we can agree on the answer of Jesus, then that is the unity to be focused on. We should not be following anywhere, anyone else, even if that means ourselves. As Paul puts it, was Paul crucified for you? Or how about this one? Was Ryan? Was Pastor Tom? Was Trump or Biden? Was any other person that you listened to or trust crucified for you? Or were you baptized in their name? No, of course not. Can we agree here today that Jesus is our foundation and which has been laid for us? Speak it or type it now. Now that we've established our foundation, Let's look at, happen, look at hap, what happens when we lay our foundation of Christ. We'll jump ahead in 1 Corinthians to uh, chapter 3 now. Uh, 11 through 15. Uh, verse 11 says here, No one can lay a foundation other than the one that's already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, in the Old Testament, it, it, um, it prophesies about Jesus in this way. This is Psalms uh, 18 or uh, 118 verse 22 the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and in Isaiah 28 16 behold I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation a tried stone a precious cornerstone a sure foundation whoever believes will not act hastily we'll pick up in uh, verse 12 if anyone builds on this foundation using gold silver costly stones wood hay or straw the work will be shown for what it is because the day, which they're talking about judgment, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive reward. But if it's burnt up, the builder will suffer much loss but yet will be saved. Even though as one escaping through the flames. 
You see, we spend so much time arguing with, no, with one another what's right or wrong with the world that we become judges which can take the place of Christ and others. All we must do, if we agree, is that Jesus is the foundation and let him be the judge of somebody else's work. Even if they fail, but believe in Jesus in their heart, they too will be saved. Isaiah 64, 8 says this, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. We need to allow Jesus to mold us and shape us by accepting and following him, not the ways of the world. That is the message to others that we need to focus on. The simple answer, Jesus. If you know Jesus now, then you might remember how it all started. That fire or passion burning inside you. The newness of seeing the world in a different light. In fact, our earth, earthly relationships have the same impact as us. Think about when you first fell in love. You felt the butterflies and the sparks flying. A smile was on your face just being around that person. As time goes on, worldly things get in the way of those initial feelings, whether it be money, personalities, children, bills, or jobs. There are many different distractions to take us away from the love we first felt. Rosie and I have experienced that roller coaster ride over the years. And one thing to always bring us back is reflecting on the beginnings of our relationship and seeing how love prevailed through the ups and downs. The same thing can happen with our relationship with Jesus. We can become so distracted by the outside world that we lose that spark and fire in our heart for Jesus that we first felt in the beginning. We believe in him, but lose sight of the greater purpose of him working in our lives. I've let it happen to me from time to time, but I want to share to you um, when it all started uh, for me. I wasn't in a church. I, nobody spoke fancy scripture to me. I was in, I was in rehab. I was in a 30-day program. I was reading the NA book. And that one Saturday morning, came across a, a reading in there that said, the road to recovery is very simple. You only have to change one thing. And that's everything. And I was like, wow, change everything. How do I do that in 30 days? Um, but because I had walked away from God before, the, the concept of him came back. And in that moment, I just said, okay, God, what do you have for me? God knew my heart surrendered in that moment. That's the first time I felt the Holy Spirit, that fire and burn inside me. Not only did I have that feeling in my heart, but I also saw the world in a different way. It was like I had to er erase what I knew about the world around me and relearn everything, but this time with Jesus by my side. I remember feeling so safe and empowered after that moment, but when it came to leave, I, quick I quickly became afraid of the world I was about to re-enter. Even though I had a life-changing moment, the outside world was still the same. We must be on guard with our five senses because it's our only, connect, our only way we are connected to the world through our touch, taste, smell, hearing, and our sight. If we do not have a moment-by-moment -moment surrender to Jesus, not just a belief, then we will also be quickly influenced by the world around us. Since that time, I've had many affirmations of the impact of my gut feeling versus my heart feelings. In my gut feelings, it creates an argumentative nature that leads me to the notion of having to be right versus my heart feeling, which leads me to surrender. I want to give you a more recent example of what ignoring the world around you and choosing Jesus can lead to. The past couple weeks have been particularly difficult uh, for me for many reasons. Um, anywhere from shuffling the kids around to where they need to be. The transition from school to summer break has caused an uptick in attention for them. 
teeth having to be pulled, dealing with an episode of lice in the house, Rosie going through a difficult season of intrusive thoughts and anxiety, which caused sleepless nights, also preparing the message for today, all while having my normal duties at the thrift boutique. In all that, my mind was a mess. Two Fridays ago, a lady called from Craigslist interested in a waterbed. Can you believe that those things are still around today? <laughs> anyway, she was super excited about it, but was also concerned if there was any leaks. I told her I would go to the warehouse to further investigate to put her at ease. After I did that, I sent her better close-up pictures of the bed to try to bring her at peace with the purchase. When I got back to the store, I called her to see what she wanted to do. Well, come to find out, she's currently in California, but is coming back to Florida in a couple of weeks, and she'll be living at her friend's house until she finds a place of her own. Her friend lives in Palm Coast, and it would have to have been delivered there. That is outside our delivery area, but I made an exception for her and told her that the, the delivery would have to be $50 instead of 35 She had no problem with that, but what came next caught me off guard. She said, I see that you're a Christian organization, and you mentioned that you help people with furnishings. Well, I'm moving back with nothing and have very little money. If there's anything else you guys have that can bring with you, it would be greatly appreciated. I did not see that coming. In my mind, I was like, well, how are you, how are you traveling then? Can't your friend help you? Man, this is a far distance for us to give stuff away. But instead, in spite of the distance for us to travel and my, judgment thought, and my judgmental thoughts, I said to her very patiently, and I, I said, well, could you help me out by putting a, a, together a, a list of things that you might need so I can get a better idea uh, of what to put together um, so, uh, so that way we need to you know, know what, what to load up. Well, Monday came around, which was this, this past Monday, and she sent her list, and it was a quite detailed list. <laughs> Anywhere from a pizza cutter to lamps to a small desk was on the list. When I came into the this, this store this past Tuesday morning, I was in a panic, trying to get the kids to VBS, still working on the message, and now having to collect items throughout the store and warehouse before the guys were ready to leave on the truck for the day. It worked out to where we filled the entire truck with living room furniture, bedroom furniture, li linens, and household items. Oh yeah, not to forget, of course, the waterbed. After I sent the guys off, I stayed in my car to call her to let her know the guys were on the way with a full truck. Well, I was, car off. I was caught off guard again by what she was about to share with me. She told me her personal story of leaving her home in Florida years ago to pr pursue a mission from God in California, and how being a fellow Christian, she decided to give 90% of her belongings to complete strangers because she couldn't take anything with her. Now that the time had come for her to move, and she now didn't have anything to come back to, so for her to see how God brought it back in full circle, affirm the trust of Jesus in her life. She thanked me for coming into her life and being a blessing to her. But I told her the opposite. I said that she was a blessing to me by showing me that if I can put aside the busyness and distractions of my life and I choose Jesus, how we then become unified in the body of Christ. We both had different views on the impact of that story, but our common denominator was Jesus. So instead of trying to correct the choices or decisions of others, we should, let, we should be letting God judge their work. Because you know what? Even if what they have built burns, they are still saved in, the belief, in their belief in Jesus. The discord or quarreling that happens in church only damages a person or turns people away. The thing we must be perfectly united in thought and in mind is our foundation in Jesus. What happens from there is merely 
up to God. If you're here today, yes, even you at home, and you've had that fire for Jesus, or maybe it hasn't happened yet, then I urge you to surrender your life either again or the, for the very first time to our common ground, Jesus Christ. And let's come together as the body of Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.